putting up a good fight. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Look at verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Jump down to verse 14, if you would. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the people that you love so much. I pray that you'd come breathe life on us through the Holy Spirit. I pray you would do the work that only you can do in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. When I was 18 years old, the Lord called me to a very unusual little Bible college in Maine. I had been praying since the junior, I think actually since really my sophomore year in high school about where to go to prepare for ministry, and it came down to a choice between Faith School of Theology in Maine or Southeastern College in Florida, and I really wanted to go to Florida. I love Florida. And it came right down to the time that I had to make my decision, and I was fasting, and I was praying for direction, and I went to a church service one night. And the speaker got up, actually it was a woman named Gwen Shaw, for those of you that remember her. And she read from Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 3. You've circled this mountain long enough, now turn north. And when those words left her lips, I knew I had my answer from the Lord. <laughs> Besides the cold... The other reason that I was a little dubious about Faith School of Theology is that it was a very old-fashioned Pentecostal holiness school. I was introduced to a whole raft of holiness rules that I had never heard before. Women weren't allowed to wear any makeup. They weren't allowed to wear any jewelry except a wedding ring or a watch. They weren't allowed to cut their hair any shorter than shoulder length. They weren't allowed to wear pants ever, not even for gym class. They wore culottes for gym. Their skirts had to come down to well below their knees. Their necklines had to come up to their chins. Their sleeves had to come down past their elbows. They weren't allowed to wear open-toed shoes or sandals or flip-flops or clogs. Men weren't allowed to wear our hair any longer than our shirt collars. We weren't allowed to grow out sideburns or mustaches or beards. They didn't have soul patches back then, but if they did, they would have been banned. <laughs> weren't allowed to wear any jewelry either except a watch and a wedding ring. Weren't allowed to wear shorts or tank tops. We all wore uniforms. All the men sat on one side of the chapel and all the women sat on the other side of the chapel. Dating was forbidden until your senior year, and then you had to have a chaperone from the faculty. Oh yeah, those were good times, you and your date and one of your teachers. <laughs> there were mandatory morning prayers at 7 a.m., dorm curfew was 9 p.m., and lights out was at 11 p.m. We were all signed duties around the campus. No television, no movies, no bowling, no roller skating, no ice skating on an indoor rink. Anything you could basically think of that might be fun, it was banned. <laughs> you know, mainstream Pentecostals, like the Assemblies of God in the U.S., have long since moved away from those old holiness standards. And we needed to, because Pentecostalism got bogged down into the ditch of legalism. Paul writes about that in Colossians 2. He says, although such regulations have an appearance of divine wisdom, they actually lack any value in restraining sensual desires. In other words, Paul is saying that true holiness cannot be legislated. But, you know, behind all of those draconian rules, there was something good at Faith School of Theology 
that's by and large missing in the church today. And that is a heart that is hungry for holiness. Behind the rules, I discovered a heart attitude that was pure and pleasing to God. It gave rise to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street. It gave rise to the greatest revival movement in the history of the church, of which we're still a part today. It gave rise to the greatest missionary enterprise in the history of the world. It was a yearning desire to be as close to God as possible. It was a desire to please Him. It was a desire to have absolutely nothing present in my life that would interfere in any way with our intimacy with Him. There was an old hymn, Nothing between my soul and my Savior, so that His blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of His favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing between. Throwing out the old holiness rules was a good idea. In fact, it was absolutely necessary. But inadvertently, I'm afraid that we also threw out the hunger for holiness. When it comes to forsaking sin and pursuing holiness, a lot of believers today are just too passive. I've had believers say to me, well, you know, God loves me just the way I am. Yes, that's true. But he also loves you too much to let you stay the way you am. I've had believers say, well, if God wants me to change something, he'll tell me. He already has. I've had believers say to me, well, if God wants me to give something up, he's just going to have to take the desire away from me. That's not the way it works. That kind of passive mindset is not in agreement with the teaching of Jesus or of the New Testament. Paul said that true believers are people who are eager to do what's good. Jesus himself said that we have a personal responsibility when it comes to righteousness. He said in the Sermon on the Mount that righteousness is something that we must hunger and thirst after. We have to desire it. He said that we have to pursue it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Uh, See, somebody went right to the promise line. We love the promise line. And all these things shall be added unto you. I want all those things to be added unto me. But we forget that Jesus linked that promise with our pursuit of Christ-likeness. He said that perfect is something that we must become. The rest of the New Testament agrees. Holiness is something that we are called to pursue. And sin is something that we're called to resist and to prevail against. The writer of Hebrews expects us to put up a good fight against sin. He said, considering the ultimate price that Jesus paid on the cross for your salvation and considering the amazing dedication and perseverance of the saints that went before you, you haven't put up very much of a fight against sin. You haven't resisted very much. You haven't exerted very much effort. You you haven't suffered very much. I had a friend in college, and we would say to her, Hey, Kath, let's go get an ice cream. And she would hold out her hand, and she would say, Twist my arm. And we would just touch her hand, and she'd say, Oh, oh, stop, stop, I'll go. (laughs) You know, we're a lot like that. Too many times when temptation comes our way, we shout uncle before any pressure is even on us. In your struggle against sin, you haven't put up much of a fight. Jacob wrestled with God at a brook called Jabbok, and he refused to let go of God until he blessed him with a changed nature. The blessing that Jacob wrestled for was not more money. It wasn't more success. It wasn't more sex or it wasn't more children. His cup was overflowing with all of those things. The blessing that Jacob wrestled for was freedom from his old lying nature. It was freedom from his manipulative ways of doing things that had wreaked havoc in his personal relationships for 20 years. Jabbok means to be emptied out. 
And that's what Jacob wanted. He wanted to be emptied out of his old nature, and he wanted a new identity. He went down into that brook, a conniving schemer, and he came up out of that brook, a prince with God. Two truths I see. First, the transformation of our inner nature is exclusively the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can change us. But I do see a second truth, and that is we have a role to play. We have a responsibility. Just like Jacob, we're supposed to put up a good fight against temptation and sin and our sinful nature. Looking at the New Testament, I find five ways that we're called to put up a good fight against sin. Five ways that we're called to put up a good fight. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Hey, by quickly, it was a miracle. We had five minutes left on the clock at the end of first. So Jesus might be coming back. You better pray. (laughs) Five ways to put up a good fight. Number one, repent. Repent. One reason that many people in the church today are so passive about sin It's because they've never had a real experience with repentance. Repentance is a gift from God. It is a grace from God. It is the extension of God's kindness to us. God offers people a divine window of opportunity to repent. And he enables their hearts to respond in that moment. Repentance is not reluctant rule keeping. It's not a decision to toe the line out of a sense of fear or duty. Repentance is a radical change in your heart. There was a a man and his wife who were walking through the mall one day. And as they went by a pet store, there was a parrot on a perch out front, and it called to the man, Hey, buddy! The man turned and looked surprised at the parrot. And the parrot said to him, you're fat and your wife is ugly. (laughs) The man and his wife were incensed. They went into the store manager and they complained. And the manager apologized profusely and he said, I'll take care of it. He grabbed a ruler and he went out and he hit the parrot on the head. Thwack, thwack, thwack. The parrot was still reeling from the blows when the man and his wife left. A while later, they passed by the same store again, and they purposely were avoiding making eye contact with that parrot. But a familiar voice called out, Hey, buddy! The man looked over his shoulder, and he glared. And the parrot looked back at him, and he said, You know. (laughs) You see, he had a, a momentary change of mind, but he didn't have a change of heart. That's not repentance. Listen, you're about to hear the best stuff you ever heard on repentance. Repentance is a gift of godly sorrow that fuels an intense hunger for change. I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be like this anymore. I don't want to hurt people anymore. I think that was the line in the prayer of Jabez that became a touchstone for so many millions and millions of people. I don't want to be in pain anymore. I don't want to be a pain anymore. I don't want to cause people I love pain anymore. Repentance is an abiding upward aspiration. It is a perpetual desire inside of me to be holy. It's a perpetual desire to be free from sin, to live clean, to be pure, to be less and less like a fallen man and more and more like Jesus. Beloved, listen, you must understand this. Repentance is not just a one-time deal. It is true that our salvation in Christ definitely begins with a defining moment of repentance, but we're not all done with repentance after that. Jesus described repentance as an ongoing beautiful attitude in the hearts of believers. Blessed are those who are continually poor in spirit. Blessed are those who continually mourn. Blessed are those who are continually submitted to God. Blessed are those who continually hunger and thirst after righteousness. 
Repentance is an ongoing grace in my heart that prompts me to constantly undergo examination. As I read the Bible, the grace of repentance prompts me to measure my life against God's words. It prompts me to reflect on my thoughts and my words and my behaviors. As I pray, the grace of repentance prompts me to invite the Holy Spirit to search my heart and to reveal anything that's out of order. David prayed, search me, O God. Know my heart. Test my thoughts, examine my ways, reveal anything wicked inside of me, and lead me in your path of everlasting life. If you have the beautiful attitude of repentance in your heart, a prayer like that will be a regular part of your prayer life. That's a far cry from the passive attitude, well, if God wants me to change, he'll let me know. It's a proactive attitude. God, please show me if there's anything because I don't want anything in my life that puts distance between me and you. Repentance helps us to put up a good fight against sin because it is submitting to the Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 13, Paul says that the only way to subdue our sinful nature is to submit to the Holy Spirit. And that's what repentance is. It's responding to the Holy Spirit's inner voice of conviction. It's agreeing with the Holy Spirit's witness about righteousness. It's surrendering and submitting to Him. All right, Lord, uh, you're right, I'm wrong, and I want to be right with you. Beloved, listen, respond quickly when the Holy Spirit pricks your conscience. You can head off a sin problem before it becomes a sin problem. If you respond quickly when the Holy Spirit prompts you and prods you, then it's easier to respond to Him again and again and again. It gets easier and easier, but if you resist the Holy Spirit, if you ignore his conviction, if you ignore his promptings, then it becomes harder and harder to hear his voice. I just feel a word from the Holy Spirit. Don't resist him. Don't resist his leading. Don't resist his prompting. God says my spirit will not always strive with mankind. Paul said don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Hebrews says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. The Holy Spirit's convicting you about something in your life. Respond to him. Surrender and submit. Five ways to put up a good fight against sin. Number two, along with repentance goes renunciation. Renunciation. I'm going to teach a principle this morning, and I think it's a huge key and a reason why believers don't always go all the way through to victory the way the Word says we can and should. Renunciation is radically breaking partnerships with sin. Sin is a powerful spiritual force. It is fueled by powerful spiritual beings. And when we sin, we partner with them. We're going to do a series in July called Things Unseen. We're going to be talking about angels and demons and heaven and hell and the final resurrection of all men. But when we sin, we come into partnership with those spiritual powers. We come into agreement with them. We give them a foothold in our life. And the way we break those partnerships is to couple repentance with renunciation. Repentance is a change of heart that leads to a change of direction. I was going one way, and I do an about face, and I go completely the opposite way. The way I begin that about face is through renunciation. How do we renounce sin? Got to go fast. How do we renounce sin? Number one, through verbal confession. Through verbal confession. Verbally confess your sins to God and ask Him to forgive you. Do it out loud so that all of heaven and all of hell can hear you. Confession procures God's forgiveness. And it releases the cleansing agent of the blood of Jesus. What does the word say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? And to cleanse. 
from all unrighteousness by the blood of Jesus. After you confess your sins, verbally renounce them and renounce and break all partnerships associated with them. For example, if you have a sin problem with foul language, confess that sin to God, ask for his forgiveness, and then renounce that sin specifically, and then renounce and break every partnership you have made with spirits of profanity, with spirits of blasphemy, with spirits of verbal abuse or cursing or death wishes or spirits of uncleanness. You can learn more about this in the class we offer called Cleansing Stream. And then you can go on the Cleansing Stream retreat with us and learn how to do that. We're going to do that in September. You might say, Pastor Glenn, that sounds like an awful lot of work. Yes, putting up a good fight against sin is a bit of work. I would just add very quickly that believers' baptism is also a powerful act of confession and renunciation that breaks partnerships with sin. If you haven't received believer's baptism, you need to do that to help you put up a good fight against sin. How do we renounce sin? First, through verbal confession. And secondly, now I want you to hang tight with me because this is the heart of it right here. Secondly, through purging. Physically get rid of everything that is identified with sinful practices and with the sins of your past. All right, everybody look at me. In the Old Testament... God told his people to go through their homes and to find every last bit of yeast and to remove it out of their homes and to destroy it. Yeast is a symbol of sin because it's alive, because it spreads fast and it thoroughly infiltrates whatever it is introduced to. Yeast has to be eradicated completely because Jesus said if there's even just a pinch of it, it will transform the whole batch. In the same way, Paul commands us in the New Testament, get rid of the old yeast. That is, get rid of everything connected to your past sins. The writer of Hebrews says, throw off the sins that entangle you. That's the same word for the witnesses throwing off their coats when they stoned Stephen. Paul uses that same word when he says, with regard to your former way of life, throw off your old self. Get rid of, throw off, throw out. Now everybody follow me this morning, because this is radical. When you go through your home, And when you go through your personal effects and you purge them of the things identified with your sinful past, it is a powerful act of renunciation. And it breaks partnerships with sin and it subdues your sin nature. So here's what to do. Number one, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal anything to you that you should get rid of. How many of you know that God is faithful? And so if we ask him to reveal things to us that need to go, how many of you know he'll answer? When we pray that prayer, reveal anything wicked in me, guess what? God will answer that prayer quicker than you think. And then let the search begin. Pastor Nick shared about this at length on Wednesday evening. If you couldn't join us this last Wednesday evening, the audio is available either on CD or you can go on our website and get it called Fresh Look at Spiritual Strongholds. But quickly, what are some things that we should look for? Look for anything that is connected in any way to witchcraft or to occult practices. Get rid of Ouija boards. Get rid of tarot cards, books on witchcraft, pentagrams, crystals, amulets. I don't care if the crystals are pretty. If they've been ooga booga by some new age practitioner, get them out of your house. Amulets potions of any kind. Someone is bringing Harry Potter tonight. He's going on the fire tonight. Look for anything that's... And listen, Harry Potter shouldn't be in your house. Look for anything connected in any way to idolatry, false religions, Eastern religions, spiritism, and New Age religions. You shouldn't have any statues of idols in your house. You shouldn't have any Buddhas in your house. You shouldn't have any Hindu gods in your house or pictures of yogis. No icons or statues of saints. No holy books from other religions. 
Don't keep false translations of the Bible in your house. Don't keep a Jehovah's Witness Bible in your house. Don't keep a Book of Mormon in your house. Don't keep any Christian science books in your house. Don't keep any books on healing that are not expressly Christian and talk about healing in the name of Jesus and through the power of his shed blood on the cross. Don't think any, keep anything connected to Native American religion or good luck charms. Growing up in Pennsylvania, hex symbols from the Pennsylvania Dutch were a big thing that needed to be purged from a lot of people's properties. Look for anything connected to horror or gore. Had a, a sweet girl that was part of our congregation some years ago. She was actually a very successful executive for a major company, but she had a real problem with fear. Had a real problem with anxiety and, and nightmares and night terrors. And when we sat down to pray and talk about it a little bit, found out that she was a huge fan of those hideous Anne Rice novels about vampires. You know, forgive me for one second, but duh. <laughs> you know, listen, beloved, for those of you that are into fitness, just like whatever you feed your body physically becomes part of your body, whatever you feed your mind, whatever you feed your spirit becomes part of you, whether that's good or bad. And that's good preaching right there. Look for anything connected in any way to drugs. Don't keep a bong as a keepsake from your partying days. <laughs> Roach clips or grinders or rolling papers. Oh, this has been a fun week this last week. We've had some moms and dads doing some search and destroy missions and they found some things. Don't keep any drug paraphernalia of any kind. Look for anything that's connected in any way to sexual impurity. Shades of gray should make you turn shades of red. Burn it on the fire so that Jesus can make you lily white. Go through your books, go through your videos, go through your DVDs, go through your music. Get rid of any music that is connected in any way with Satan and with demons. Listen, it's not rocket science. If a musician identifies himself as the prince of darkness, then probably his music doesn't belong in your soul or in your house. Beyonce. Oh, I'm so sorry about Beyonce. Used to love her way back. Destiny's Child. Beyonce openly talks about the fact that she is possessed by a spirit named Sasha who takes over while she's performing. Her mind blanks out and she can't even remember what she did during performances. I don't know about you, but I don't care to be serenaded by a demon. Bounce Beyonce. And junk her husband, Jay-Z, because he says the same thing. Search through your games. Search through your video games, your computer. Delete, erase, unfriend, block. Do whatever you have to do. Take a careful look at your jewelry. Know what the symbols are on your jewelry. Somebody's going to go home mad at me, so I might as well go all the way over the top. <laughs> Tell you about the Italian horn. The Italian horn is a good luck amulet. And it is meant to ward off the evil eye, to protect you from the evil eye. An Italian horn doesn't belong laying over the heart of a believer in Jesus Christ. That's good preaching. Take a careful look at jewelry made in Africa or the Caribbean or by Native Americans. Listen, it's not that everything has to go, but take a look through. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit. If you get a check in your spirit about something, get it out of your house. Take a careful look at curios that you've brought home from faraway places. Had a little girl a while back ago who was plagued by nightmares. Turns out that over her bed she had a Native American dream catcher that someone had brought home from a trip out west after her parents went through the cleansing stream course and read the little book that we share in that class called Cleansing Your Home from Spiritual Darkness. They got rid of the dream catcher, destroyed it, and guess what? The nightmares went away. Take a careful look at your artwork. When I travel, I love to bring home a little bit of artwork from wherever I go. Nothing expensive, but just little things that remind me of the people and the cultures that, where I've been. I was in Egypt with Pastor Steve, and they took us to a place where they do painting on papyrus, all done from the ancient uh, techniques. And the, a guide was showing us all, all the different paintings and all the ooga booga symbols in the paintings from Egyptian uh, religion and gods, and this stood for this and that stood for that. And I found this little painting with two ducks on it. And I asked the guide, I said, what do ducks mean? 
And he looked at me like I was stupid. He said, a duck is just a duck. I said, great, I'll take that one right there. <laughs> I was in a Chinese market in Singapore and I had little scrolls made for our kids with their names written in Chinese letters. And the sweet lady that was doing them painted pretty little flower vines on the girl's scrolls. And on my son, she wanted to put a dragon. And I said to her, no, no, I said, no dragon. And she said to me immediately when I said, no dragon, she said, you're a Christian. And I said, yes, I'm a Christian. No one had to explain to her why Christians and those symbolisms of dragons didn't belong with one another. Take a careful look at your kids' toys. Look through your closets and your bureau drawers. There might even be articles of clothing you need to get rid of. Look through boxes of junk in your attic or your basement that you inherited from your family. Look through your drawers and the places that you keep your mementos. Listen, don't keep pictures or love letters or items from old lovers. Don't keep trophies from past sexual conquests. If you have a little black book, burn it. If you have a belt with notches in it, burn it. Get rid of keepsakes that you saved as a remembrance of a sinful event. All of those things constitute glorying in the flesh, boasting in the flesh. Now our only boast is in the Lord. Got this from the Holy Spirit this morning, early this morning, so I know it's for somebody here today. Get rid of anything that you have kept that is a reminder to you of how you were wrong. Get rid of anything that reminds you of a loss in a way that keeps you bound to a spirit of grief or sorrow. Had a girl in our church back in Philadelphia, and she was engaged to be married, and on the morning of her wedding day, she found out that the man she was engaged to was already married to someone else. She took her wedding dress home and she hung it on the back of her door. And like something out of a Charles Dickens novel, every day for 20 years, she would go home and look at that wedding dress and cry. Finally, when someone explained to her about renunciation, she took that wedding dress and she burned it on an Ephesian bonfire, and Jesus set her free from that grief and that bitterness. She met a nice young guy, and they got married a little while later. Take a look at your collections and see if they tie you in any way to your past. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. Let the search begin and then destroy whatever you must. Beloved, look at me. Word from the Holy Spirit. Don't hold on to anything that the Holy Spirit tells you to let go of. What a powerful testimony from Peter Gamble last week. And he talked about how he was trying to beat drug addiction. And he would get rid of 90%, but he'd hold on to just 10. And just that little bit of yeast, that little bit, that 10%, it would grow back again and again and again until he got rid of it all. Putting up a, a good fight against sin is costly. Renunciation is costly. Purging your home and your personal effects, it might be costly. Acts chapter 19 revive, records the revival in the city of Ephesus. The fear of God fell on that city, and they had a huge public service of confession and renunciation. They lit a fire, and people brought items that were connected to idolatry and to witchcraft and to the sins of their past, and they burned them on a fire. They added the value of those items up, and conservatively, the total was about $6 million worth of property that they burned in today's money. Don't have time to really go there, but in both Testaments, there's a principle that anything that cannot be cleansed must be burned with fire. This is something that we used to do a long time ago. Haven't done it in a while, but we're going to do it tonight. At 7 o'clock tonight, we're lighting a fire. We're going to worship for a little bit, and then we're going to break partnerships with sin through prayers of confession and acts of renunciation. We're going to burn what can be burned and what can't be burned, what shouldn't be burned. We have a big dumpster out back. We're going to throw it away. Between now and then, I'm wondering if you would ask the Holy Spirit to show you if there are things in your home, if there are things among your personal effects that need to go. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test my thoughts. Examine my ways. Reveal any wicked thing in me 
and lead me in the path of everlasting life. Five ways to put up a good fight against sin. Don't have time to elaborate on the last three. I'm going to just shoot them out to you quickly. Closely related to renunciation, number three is to remove temptation. To remove temptation. Radically reorder your life. Radically reorganize your life to avoid temptation. New Testament uses several different expressions to tell us to remove temptation from us or to remove ourselves from temptation. Flee, run away, avoid, don't associate with, abstain from. That means don't participate in. Paul said in Romans 13, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Jesus actually spoke most radically of all about removing temptation from our lives. He said, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out and throw it away. It's better to go through life with one eye than to be thrown into hell with both eyes wide open. If your right hand offends you, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to go through life with a hand missing than to be thrown into hell with both arms flailing. Now, everybody look at me. I, I had to be perfectly clear about something, okay, because we're talking about purging our homes and burning things with fire, literally, but look at me. Jesus did not literally mean to pluck out your eye or cut off your hand, okay? I, just, I want you to know that he, he didn't mean that literally. Some people down through church history thought he really did mean it literally with disastrous consequences. I've had people get mad at me when I say Jesus didn't mean that literally, I've had people argue with me about it. I noticed that they had two eyes and two hands. <laughs> Jesus didn't mean for us to take these words literally, but he did mean for us to take them to heart. What Jesus means is take whatever radical steps you have to take to remove the sources of temptation from your life. Before you go to the radical step of yanking out your eye, why not just yank out your cable or your internet? It's better to go through life without an iPhone, iPad, iMac, <laughs> iii, than to be thrown into hell with all your gadgets. It's better to go through life without a handheld internet device than to be thrown into hell while surfing the web. Putting up a good fight against sin means that we have to radically rearrange some things in our lives in order to avoid temptation. There are some places we must never return. There are some friendships and associations that we need to cut off. There are some things we just can't participate in anymore. Let me give you two fast truths about temptation. First truth about temptation, it is not a sin to be tempted. The Bible says Jesus was tempted in every way, just like we are yet without sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's only a sin when we entertain temptation. Second truth about temptation is as a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't ever have to give in to temptation. Paul said, for every conceivable scenario of temptation that you could ever find yourself in, God has a way of escape for you. Hebrew says, God gives you grace to help you in your time of need when you're being tempted, so ask him. Five ways to put up a good fight against sin. Very quickly, number four, retrain your mind. Retrain your mind, radically renew your mind through the word of God. The war against sin is waged on the battlefield of your mind. Colossians 3 teaches us that the way to push the bad stuff out of your mind is to flood your mind with the good stuff. I did go to Maine, and it was pretty darn cold. And I learned something from the Mainers. When it's bitter cold outside, you have to make sure that your gas tank is full or reasonably full to keep condensation out of the tank. If the tank is empty, condensation can develop inside. You'll get water in your gas. You'll have all kinds of problems. So if you know that it's going to be cold, you have to fill it up with the right stuff. And the same thing is true of our minds. The way to push the bad stuff out is to fill it up with the good stuff. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Fill your mind with his word. Bible reading, Bible memorization, 
Bible teaching. Listen, use your commute time as your time to just fill up your mind before you go out with all those heathens. I know it's rough out there. Go fill your mind up on the way into work with the good things. Listen to some good preaching, teaching of the Word. Get Download the Bible on your iPod and plug it in and, and listen to the Word of God. There's some crazy cable channel uh, on cable. It's like family Bible reading channel. And just, they just read the word of God and, and I get snagged every time. I'm clicking through the channels and I stop on it. Next thing I know, like 45 minutes later, I'm just listening to the word of God. Fill your mind with worship and thankfulness and Christian conversation. All of those things are sowing to the spirit. And when we do them, the spirit supernaturally washes and transforms our mind. Five ways to put up a good fight against sin. Finally, this Last thing, reach out to brothers and sisters for help. Reach out to brothers and sisters for help. Pastor Jason, you can come and help me. Become fully engaged in your church. James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you might be healed. The prayers of righteous people are powerful and effective. If you've been losing fights against sin and temptation, perhaps it's because you've been fighting alone. The Bible says one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put ten thousand to flight. Reach out for help. Reach out for deliverance prayer. You don't have to stay bound by anything. You don't have to stay in bondage to addiction or anger or adultery or abuse or anxiety. Deliverance prayer is available for you right here at Harvest Time. If you've never taken the class called Cleansing Stream this September, you, you need to take it. Maybe I'll even teach it myself again and come take it with us. Deliverance prayer is available. Reach out for intercessory prayer. You don't have to pray alone for the changes that you need in your life. Enlist others to pray with you. Reach out for Christian counsel from the Word of God. We're blessed. We have about a dozen different Christian counselors that are part of our congregation here, and they're willing to work with you. We have groups for men and groups for women. We have Pathways Ministry on Tuesday evenings that teaches you how to put up a good fight against sin. And finally, reach out for an accountability and a prayer partner. Sisters, find a sister through our ladies' ministry. Brothers, find a brother through our men's ministry. Couples, find other couples through our adult discipleship ministries and reach out for help. Five ways to put up a good fight against sin. Repent. Renounce. Remove temptation. Retrain your mind and reach out to brothers and sisters for help. May God never say of us, you didn't put up a very good fight against sin. Instead, let's hold on like Jacob until we're emptied out of our old nature and we rise up princes with the Most High God. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this house. Oh, come on, I know we can do a little better than that. Let's give Jesus a great big praise in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Had an old hymn on my heart all week. Pastor Jason's going to sing it. If you know the words, sing with us. And all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give and I will ever love and trust in his presence daily and I
sing that again. Make it your prayer to the Lord. I surrender all. on Jesus for just one moment. Come on, lift up your hands, lift up your face to heaven. Would you just love, would you just do that right now? Would you just surrender everything to him? Come on, somebody, Holy Spirit's been wrestling. God says, my spirit won't always strive. God will either change people or he'll change people. God will either, you'll either yield and, and let God do the work he wants to do or he'll move on from you. Come on, just surrender it. Surrender it right now. Thank you, Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me for one moment? We're going to receive communion as our final act of worship today. But I have to ask this question. Have you been putting up a good fight against sin? Is that, that heart of repentance, that that inward upper aspiration oh that a man would rise up in me that the man I am might cease to be have you been putting up a good fight seven o'clock tonight we're going to do a powerful act of renunciation and just to prepare our hearts for that I wonder if you would pray with me in the words of David and invite the Holy Spirit to search you and just show you if there's anything that needs to go on the fire or in the dumpster. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Would you just repeat after me? And let's pray that prayer of David. And then we're going to receive communion. Let's pray. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Search me, O oh God. Test my thoughts. Search me, O oh God. Examine my ways. Reveal any wicked thing in me. Reveal any wicked thing in my home. Reveal any wicked thing among my personal items. And lead me in the path of everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, would you give a praise to the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask those that are waiting on us to come. Sing one more time, I Surrender All. And I surrender. believer in Jesus, we invite you to share with us at this table today. Just a moment, we're going to ask you to leave your seat, come down the center aisle, receive your communion emblems. If you'd return to your seats using the side aisles, when everyone has been served, we're going to receive together. Pastor Jason's going to lead us in worship while you come. The word for communion in the Bible is thanksgiving. So come with thanksgiving in your heart for everything Jesus has done. Make that confession, Jesus is Lord. Make it personal, Jesus is my Lord. Thank you, Father. Paul wrote to the believers at Corinth, I received from the Lord that which I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for the body of our Lord. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you gave Jesus your only son. Thank you that his body was broken so that we might be made whole in every way. Whole in our spirit, whole in our soul, whole in our bodies. Father, we thank you that his body was broken so that we who were not a people could now become the people of God, the body of Christ. Father, we pray that while we receive this bread, you would supernaturally release the beautiful unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. Father, we pray that while we receive this bread, you would make us one, even as the Father and the Son are one, as we partake together of this one loaf, Jesus. We thank you in the name of our great Savior. Amen and amen. Let's receive the bread together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, church, just give him some thanks right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Listen, if you need a healing in your body, I want you to just reach up your hand, and I want you to just receive it by faith in the cross of Jesus. God sent his word, Jesus, and healed our disease. Come on, just reach up your hand if you need a healing, and just take it. Say, Father, I believe. Father, I receive in Jesus name Paul continues in the same way after supper Jesus took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let's give thanks father we thank you today that we are redeemed not by perishable things like gold or silver but by the precious blood of Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. We thank you, Father. We rejoice. We celebrate that though our sins were as scarlet, you've washed us whiter than snow. Thank you for your precious promise that if we sin, we have an advocate with you, Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Father, right now, by faith in the cross of Jesus, we receive everything purchased for us on Calvary. In the name of our great Savior, Jesus, everyone said, amen and amen. Let's receive the cup together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, church. Thank him one more time. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. The ushers are coming, and they're going to pass a container down your row. You can just put your empty communion cup in the container as it goes by you. Come on, sing it one more time. Amazing love. How can it be? Jesus, God, oh, God. It's coming after you.